It is my pleasure this evening to introduce the moderator of our discussion. And as Bill mentioned, these comfy chairs are awaiting our guests of honor. Our moderator tonight is Jeff Kluger, who's an award-winning journalist, editor, and writer. He's an editor at large currently for Time Magazine and Time.com, where he oversees coverage of both science and human behavior. And as a physicist, I always like to point out that science is way more understandable than human behavior. So I appreciate that he covers both. Among Jeff's many books, he has books ranging from young adult fiction to a study on sibling bonds. And he wrote the national bestseller Apollo 13, co-authored with Captain Lovell, upon which Ron Howard based the 1995 film starring Tom Hanks. So without further ado, please let's welcome Jeff Kluger to the stage. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank everyone for having me here tonight. I want to thank Michelle and Scott particularly for giving me the honor of hosting an event like this that when I was a child, I could not have dreamed I would be even present for. I look at my watch now, and I realize that 45 years ago at this moment, the man we're here to honor tonight was about to become very, very busy. We are one hour away from boom hour. But it also occurred to me that 45 years ago at this moment marks the precise instant that we were at the end of the pre-Apollo 13 era in history. And that matters a lot. The median age of the US population right now is 36.8, which means that more than half of all Americans came into the world in which the Apollo 13 mission already existed as the great object lesson, an example waiting to be discovered about how doing the improbable need not be impossible. Some children come to this story a lot earlier than most. My daughters, no surprise, got it from the cradle. They got it in utero, actually. <laughs> and one of them, my young daughter, our young daughter Paloma, 12 years old, is here tonight. One night a number of years ago, when Paloma was just six or seven, I was trying to get her to stop picking at her string beans during dinner, and I told her I expected her to eat almost all of them. Her answer was, almost all is not an option. <laughs> Other people come to the mission later. In history class, in business school courses about crisis management, and of course, in the movies. No matter how they come to it, the message of Apollo 13 is about more than just thinking creatively and courageously and solving problems on the fly. It's about something larger, something that my children help me appreciate, and is one of the reasons that it's so important that we honor everyone on this panel tonight. A few summers ago, our whole family, my wife and both of our daughters, came out to Lake Forest to stay with the Lovells, to meet their dog, Toby, and to spend a great amount of time with people I've come to consider dear friends. On the second day we were there, Jim took us to the Museum of Science and Industry to see the Apollo 8 spacecraft. And before we went in, I said to both of my daughters, Paloma and Elisa, girls, you may be too young to appreciate this right now, but this is Columbus showing you the Santa Maria. You are a rare and fortunate pair to have this experience. To my great delight, I could see that they weren't too young to experience that. With that in mind, I'd like to introduce the explorers on our panel tonight, both the ones who flew in the spacecraft and the ones who served as the field generals of those missions from mission control. As we said earlier, Gene Cernan, the command module pilot of Apollo 10 and Apollo 17, who was supposed to be here tonight, can't make it, but he is doing well and he sends his regrets. Our other guests include 
Michael Collins, Command Module Pilot of Apollo 11. Walt Cunningham, Lunar Module Pilot of Apollo 7. Charlie Duke, Lunar Module Pilot of Apollo 16. Jerry Griffin, Flight Director for Apollo 13, as well as Lead Flight Director for Apollos 12, 15, and 17, and Director of the Johnson Space Center from 1982 to 1986. Milt Windler, Lead Flight Director for Apollo 13, Maroon Team Flight Director for Apollo 14, and Flight Director for all three Skylab missions. And finally, Jim Lovell, Gemini 7, Gemini 12, Command Module Pilot for Apollo 8, and Commander of the Perilous Voyage of Apollo 13. May we have guests come up? Well, of course, my uh, objective on 13, like uh, the other flights, was to land on the moon, uh, do some exploration, come back, and, uh, and, and actually complete my active space career. I'd go back into management, but uh, I would uh, have uh, uh, something that I accomplished, something as uh, every aviator and then uh, astronaut wants to do, you know, as, as the, final, the final test of, of, uh, of your career. And of course, uh, when that did not occur, uh, for uh, years after that, I was quite frustrated. Um, for Mike Collins, after your Apollo 11 mission, uh, far too many people thought the moon had been done, the moon had been achieved. We've now shown that we can do it and flying the, to the moon could be routine. And we certainly saw this in the fall off of TV audiences for Apollo 12 and so forth. Did you believe or fear, having done this and having seen how complicated the daisy chain of getting to the moon was, did you believe or fear that an accident like Apollo 13 was likely or perhaps even inevitable? I, I certainly would not say inevitable, but likely, yes. I mean, you can only fly these machines of incredible complexity. Uh, over and over and over again. I, I wrote a book one time and said you could probably expect uh, one accident in every 50 flights. I don't know whether that's optimistic or pessimistic, but certainly out in front of us always was the idea, as you said, of having a mission which was, in fact, uh, interconnected like a daisy chain with very fragile elements, any which could unexpectedly uh, break and ruin everything downstream of that. Uh, for Charlie Duke, you were the backup, uh, uh, backup LEM pilot for Apollo 13, and that put you in the difficult position of realizing that that could have been you there had uh, one more person on the prime crew perhaps contracted what looked like it could have been the German measles. But it did also put you in the unique opportunity of being particularly well familiar with how that mission was going to be conducted and the operation of that particular lunar module. So how did your role play out in the recovery of the mission? Well, once the accident occurred, uh, the backup crew, uh, which was now T.K. Mattingly, myself, and John Young, uh, ended up in mission control within a half hour or so after the accident. And uh, uh, we uh, realized that we had uh, some procedures to work out. Uh, the flight controllers and the uh, flight directors were uh, trying to plan the uh, what do we do, how do we do it, how do we get them back safely. And so I remember uh, being in the simulator a lot. Uh, how do we power up the lunar module? How do we get them back on a free return trajectory? And all those procedures that we had to develop uh, over the time. And John, uh, John Young and I, it, and probably TK also, we spent 35 hours in mission control before we took a break. Uh, and at that point, we were on the way back home and uh, uh, I had a, a very optimistic attitude by this point that we're going to make it. If we don't make a mistake in mission control and they don't make a mistake on board, we got enough stuff to get back and we're going to make it back. So early enough on, you felt like you had this, you had the, the resources in place to. to well, make at first, uh, I don't think anybody uh, 
in the mission control said, we, we're, it, it's hopeless, we're not gonna make it. Our attitude was always positive. But uh, some time a thought would occur to you, uh, are we got, do we really have enough oxygen? Or do we really have enough uh, electrical power? So we had a spacecraft that was built for two guys for three days, and now we got uh, uh, no, two guys for three. Yeah, two guys for three days. Now we got four guys for four days. How are we going to make it last? Right. And so, and that was a credit to the talent and the uh, expertise of Mission Control and all the contractors and everybody that was supporting us. Well, y your the very fact that you flew on Apollo 7 was the result of a tragedy that opened up those three seats. So you were uniquely touched by loss during the Apollo 1 fire. And now here you were a few years later, present for Apollo 13. How did those experience, where were you on those two nights and how did those experiences affect you differently or in similar ways? The media had already dropped their interest in covering these flights live. And they, after liftoff, they hadn't done a thing about Apollo 13 until I think it was about 10 o'clock at home, I can't remember exactly, but <clears throat> it came on with a flash that Apollo 13 had had this emergency. <clears throat> I lived across the street from the uh, Mission Control Center. And I remember thinking, well, I better go see what's going on. I was worried about my friends. Uh, when you have an explosion, you think that the, the worst could come out of it. And I went over to Mission Control. I went in. And uh, as I was listening, Jack Swigert, who was the command module pilot, who'd been put on that mission just two days before, he'd been a backup for a long time. And I remember uh, listening to Jack. <clears throat> I, there's a lot of stories I could tell you about Jack, but <laughs> <clears throat> I remember this one because I listened to Jack going through the malfunction procedures on the command module. They, they had to depend on the lunar module to come home, but Jack had been our support crew on Apollo 7. We'd all worked on uh, developing these malfunction procedures. I was there about 15 minutes. I was listening to Jack. He'd gone through everything I knew that he could go through on the command module. And I went home and went to bed. Uh, that's not just a comment on Jack. It's a comment on our attitude about the people that we were living with in those days. We had the utmost confidence, almost as much as we had in ourselves, but we had the utmost confidence in our associates. Those people had been selected, and we knew that we didn't know yet whether Apollo 13 was going to make it back, but at the same time, we knew that we had the best people going anywhere in the world that had a chance of bringing this back. So I didn't really worry too much. This one is for, for Jerry Griffin. Um, you spent an enormous amount of time in mission control before Apollo 13. Was there anything in your previous missions? I know there was a harrowing moment on Apollo 12 during liftoff, but was there anything on any of those missions that prepared you even a little for the enormity of what Apollo 13 was? Uh, well, yes and no. The, um, every mission we flew, and, and the, I think the public missed some of it because some of it was more obscure, but we had a problem on every mission of some kind. It was, was it could have been really serious. And, uh, but we got them fixed and got around it. Uh, Apollo 12, you mentioned we got hit by lightning uh, right after liftoff, and it, and it almost caused us to abort. Uh, a little known fact, or a little repeated fact about Apollo 13 is that in Milt Wendler was the flight director at the time, I think you lost an engine on the second stage of the Saturn. I think it was a center engine. And, you know, everybody's eyes got about this big, but the old Saturn just kept, the second stage just kept pushing on. And uh, we got in, got them into orbit, and uh, it was fine. But that, 
And I, I remember saying, well, that's our, pro our, that's our problem for <laughs> Apollo 13. Yeah, it'll now be a we're disaster-proof. Yeah, it'll be a piece of cake from here on in. Uh, but, and, and later flights had the same issue. This one, though, uh, was just, it was of such a magnitude that, uh, but I want to repeat something that Charlie said. There was never one mention of not getting them back. And I don't think that was uh, whistling past the graveyard or anything like that. I think it was just the fact that we knew we were going to work until we got them back. This one is for Milt. The Apollo 13 movie obviously gave Gene Kranz the lion's share of, of attention for running the show in Mission Control, but there were four flight directors on this mission, and each one of you stepped into the hot seat at a different point in the evolution of the accident. Now, when you first came in and took over your, I think it was the Maroon team, what was the state of the spacecraft and the state of the emergency and how confident did you feel about, I guess it was the six hour or, or eight hour tour of duty you had ahead of you? Well, Jerry has already talked about the fact that uh, we never really thought that we couldn't get them back. It was just a question of what is the, how are we gonna do it and what's the best way to do it? And uh, I, I was lucky actually. Um, the the incident that Jerry refers to about the engine shutting down, that was almost a, a trivial thing, except it was very close to a disaster. Uh, if it had gone another cycle or two, the whole thing would have blown up. But, but the system shut down, and, 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 and the Saturn went on into orbit like it has done a hundred times probably in simulations. So uh, we, we really thought we could get them back, but it, it, it was a matter of figuring out the best way. And then uh, I was lucky, though, in that, you know, Kranz was on duty when the, when the uh, accident occurred and had that initial uh, reaction and all the confusion of the instrumentation and what was going on. And they had that a little bit sorted out. And then Lunny came on and did a magnificent job in smoothing out the situation. He got the... Uh, work with the crew, got the, and, and, and obviously all of the flight control team, and got the, um, the lunar module powered up, the command module shut down uh, pretty much, and, or did, and, uh, and got the situation under control. I had it pretty easy by the time I got on, <laughs> to tell you the truth. And uh, there was uh, all these hundred or so other questions to be solved, but you didn't feel like that, that the situation was, uh, was um, you know, going uh, out of control. It was beginning to, to be something that you could deal with. And I think that's what Jerry was talking about. That We had a lot of things going on. I, Jerry talks about the lightning hit the spacecraft. I thought that was a magnificent piece of flight control work on 12 when, when they were able to not abort because uh, nobody knew exactly what had happened. Uh, but fortunately, the German folks in Huntsville, they made a booster that was so strong it could keep going without even worrying. And it chugged on, and we were clever enough not to abort. And, and the flight control team figured out what the problem was and got it under control. And that, that had already happened. And so uh, we had, uh, I guess, a pretty fair amount of confidence that somehow we were going to get the crew back. Jim. I, I, this is one question that I've tried to get out of you for the 22 years I've known you, <laughs> and I, I know what your answer is going to be. You've always said Apollo 13 was a little like turning over cards in a solitaire game. As long as you had one more card to play, the game wasn't over yet. But was there any moment, even, even fleetingly, in the remaining hours of that mission, that you felt the need to begin to make peace with the idea that you might not be coming home? That's a good question. Uh, uh, actually, uh, you know, our, I guess our emotions uh, ran from uh, an explosion occurred, but we didn't know what caused the explosion. 
We thought at first that maybe a, a, a meteor uh, had hit the lunar module. And uh, so the first thing we did, much like a submarine crew, uh, Swiker took the uh, round hatch that uh, connected the tunnel between the two vehicles and tried to secure it to prevent uh, you know, the loss of uh, atmosphere through a hole in the, in the very fragile lunar module. Well, that wasn't true. And besides that, Swiker could never quite get it connected anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Which was, of course, in the final coming home, we had to do that. <laughs> and then uh, we thought, well, what was the explosion? And it was not, it was not uh, panic right away. Uh, I imagine if we had panicked, we'd have bounced off the wall for about 10 minutes and we'd still be there waiting for a miracle to happen. When I looked out the window and saw the oxygen escaping, and then realized uh, the situation was very serious, that the oxygen was uh, utilized, of course, not just to breathe and, and pressurize the spacecraft, but was also used to produce electricity. Uh, and without the electricity, we could use the propulsion system, and so, you know, one by one, it got worse and worse. And we, we never thought about the alternative. We always thought that as, as like you, said, and I told you many times, as long as uh, I could turn the car over, and, uh, and of course the car was a lot uh, uh, coming from uh, Mission Control right. that kept coming up with one more idea of how we could uh, keep on going. And uh, so that uh, kept on charging, and the percentage of recovery and survival kept going up and up. And of course the, uh, we finally got close to 100% when I saw the parachutes come out. <laughs> And, and uh, we didn't sink when we hit the ocean, so. <laughs> could, could, could I say something, one thing that, sure. that, and the movie played this right, but um, actually, the, probably the tightest time in the control center was during the reentry when they did not come out of blackout at the right time. Uh, the heat of reentry causes you to lose communication. And we could predict the start of it and the end of it, usually to within a second. We had clocks counting down to both. We got to the, to the end of where they should have had communication with us after we'd done all this stuff to get them back from 250,000 miles away. And Joe Kerwin, right on time, said, uh, Apollo 13, this is Houston, no answer. And he did it about every 15 seconds, I think, thereafter for the next two or three minutes. Nothing. There was, you could have heard a pin drop in the control center. Nobody said anything except for Joe Kerwin calling up. And we were all thinking, I know I was thinking, we've come all this way and that explosion got the heat shield on the command module. Now, one of the times that Joe Kerwin said, uh, Apollo 13 is Houston. Jack comes back out. Oh, hi, Houston. We're doing great. Uh, uh, and shortly thereafter, we saw, we saw the shoots, and uh, everybody was just kind of, you know, holy moly. And well, well, Jerry, let me tell you the true story. <laughs> On the way in, when we couldn't communicate, we looked at each other and said, well, it appears to be okay. Things are going fine. What do you say we delay calling? <laughs> <laughs> we could make a movie out of this. <laughs> that brings me to a slightly more morbid question, but this is... <laughs> It's actually a very legitimate one, I think, that I, I, I want to ask. Mike, your generation of astronauts did see a lot of loss. You saw Charlie Bassett and Elliot C. and Ted Friedman, who were all lost to plane crashes. You saw Gus Grissom and Ed White and, and Roger Chaffee. Um, there had been two successful uh, landings on the moon. When Apollo 13 seemed so touch and go, was there ever any point that you thought, mm, is the price getting too high? Should we be doing this? Uh, no, not at all. Maybe that's what we should have thought. Uh, <laughs> um, 
And most of us came from a background uh, like mine, which was that of a fighter pilot. You'd be in a squadron of fighter pilots for a number of years, and a bunch of your good friends are going to get killed. Unfortunately, that was just one of the facts of that life. And uh, the space program was a progression, a stair step above uh, uh, my previous existence. Uh, but no, I, I didn't give a, a, a moment's thought to this was the end of the uh, space program. I thought, God, this is awful. But, you know, it will go on. And uh, this, is, this is for Walt. Um, you guys test drove the Apollo spacecraft. And this was, uh, I, even as a child watching this at the time, I thought this took an incomprehensible amount of courage, given the fact that it was 20 months after the Apollo 1 fire, and then here you guys were taking this thing up for 11 very long days. Um, having been part of the crew that was the first to drive that ship, how did you assess the ability of the command module um, which was uh, going through the kinds of stresses it hadn't been intended to go through, powerless and, and frozen down for four days in space. How did you assess its ability to, to recover and re-enter? Well, Jeff, it's a, there's an interesting history about the command module that <clears throat> most people aren't aware of. But uh, originally, Wally, Don, and I were the prime crew on what would have been called Apollo 2. Uh, Apollo 1 was Gus at the time, <clears throat> and uh, we were still building the spacecraft, doing the testing out at North American, and we were slipping so much in the schedule that uh, eventually they, did, well, on making every change, that would cause a delay in the schedule. We had to get on the moon before the end of that decade. We all believed that and wanted that. But what happened as... Uh, the delays came up from fixing the various problems, some of which were just operational questions that we raised. Uh, they ended up canceling Apollo 2, and they also started doing all the changes, really, on what would have been the third spacecraft, that was, and eventually that was renamed Block 2. So Gus ends up with the only one with the Block 1 spacecraft. They canceled us out, and then they, because we were uh, familiar with the Block 1 spacecraft, we became Gus uh, Ed and Roger's <coughs> backup crew. And we were that for about, I guess, about three months uh, when, when they died. Uh, we uh, looked at it just as Mike just got through explaining. We know you've got to expect losses in some of this activity. Uh, there was a time in those days when we understood that as part of living and part of our life, part of being an astronaut. Uh, it did not discourage any one of us, to my knowledge. But today, that's changed a bit. They, they don't like to expect losses. So when we ended up <coughs> uh, flying the Block 2 spacecraft, which was a nice improvement, uh, a lot of changes that we wanted in Block 1, we finally got in Block 2. And uh, they was, we were trying to make up all the lost time, so uh, it was scheduled for an 11-day mission, the first mission manned. And to tell you the truth, uh, we never really expected it to go 11 days. We thought something was going to uh, cause us to come home early. Uh, I remember Wally was particularly concerned about going 11 days. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> it turns out that the vehicle was f in fabulous shape, uh, very few really significant problems. And to this day, Apollo 7 is still the longest, most ambitious, uh, most successful first uh, engineering test flight of any vehicle. That is true. That is true. I, I want to change direction a little and uh, speak about the, the grace notes in history that you guys represent. And this question is for Charlie. Your voice on Capcom during the Apollo 11 landing um, is even more well-known than Scott Carpenter's Godspeed, John Glenn. Were you aware at that moment that you were speaking for history? Was that at all in your mind? Uh, not in the least. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were uh, really concerned about the fuel state and that uh, 
we had overcome so many problems on descent, which was the, I think, one of the high points of mission control. Uh, I had the privilege of being in mission control on Capcom on Apollo 10, Apollo 11, and I was there for Apollo 13 and Apollo 17. And so uh, I look at mission control as saving the day on so many Apollo uh, spacecraft. And so we were coming down and, and we'd had communication problems, we'd had computer problems that we'd overcome. Everybody was well trained. And as we were coming down, uh, uh, a trajectory problem caused us to uh, be in an area that Neil couldn't land in, so he had to overfly, which caused a fuel depletion. And so what we, I, we were focused on was, are we going to get this landing? We, you know, we got to hurry up. This thing is we're running out of gas. And uh, so uh, uh, I called 60 seconds, and like... Uh, Jerry said during uh, re-entry in Apollo 13, dead silence. Well, the same silence was in Apollo 7. You could hear a pin drop. And that's very unusual in mission control. And uh, I called 30 seconds. And they hadn't got landed. And according to my watch, 13 seconds later, they landed. A few 17 seconds fuel remaining. Now, had we gone another 17 seconds, mission control rule was calling abort. Now, I don't think Neil Armstrong would have aborted. I mean, <laughs> that wasn't the right stuff, as uh, yeah. some people say. You know, he was 30 feet off the moon, and mm -hmm. he's going to land. But anyway, the rules were calling abort, but we didn't have to get that far. And so when I heard him land, um, uh, Buzz said, uh, engine stop, uh, uh, contact, engine stop. And there was a pause. And, uh, I mean, we were holding our breath. And... Uh, and uh, Neil, uh, so cool, Neil said, just nonchalantly almost, uh, uh, Houston, Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. And I was so excited, I couldn't even pronounce Tranquility. It came out, <laughs> Twanquility or something like that. <laughs> and I, I, I just shared my feelings. Uh, Raj, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys that have turned blue. We're breathing again. <laughs> And I had no idea that that was going to be uh, iconic words uh, on, uh, on Apollo. And uh, certainly wasn't done planned. Nothing was planned. It was just my emotions came out because it was the truth. We were holding our breath. Well, I can tell you it's going to be my next ringtone. You're saying that. <laughs> can I add well, a thought there, Jeff? Yeah. <clears throat> because you, you asked about the attitude. Did we feel emotional, what have you? There was some of that emotion, but now that it's years later, even us, when we look back, we can put these things in perspective. At the time, I don't believe that we really did that. We didn't look at it seriously because whatever you'd like to think about it, we all were committed to getting the job done. And it was step after step until we got the job done. One question I want to ask about that job, and I want to direct this to both Milt and Jerry. Um, determining what the burns would be when you were coming back around the far side of the moon, you had uh, a lot of considerations. You wanted to get them home very quickly, but uh, you didn't want to get them home too quickly until you had figured out uh, what the reentry procedures could be. You didn't want to drop the service module for fear of damaging the heat shield. So one of the longest passages, one of the most detailed passages in Jim's and my book, which is still available in all fine stores, by the way. Um, <laughs> one of the longest passages is deciding how you would come up with a burn. And you guys paradoxically or improbably chose the burn that was going to keep them in space the longest. Now, from both of you, I'd love to hear how those conversations, a little bit about how those debates took place and how you figured we're going to come out of this room and sell to the American people into mission control. We're going to keep these guys in space 24 hours longer than we otherwise would have to. Well, I don't think that's the right way to look at it exactly. Uh, we, were, we were really, part of the debate was if we used a big engine uh, and the, we had a heat 
soak back problem and it burst a diaphragm. It was in it a, and the pressure rose in the tanks. It might burst a diaphragm and that would render the engine unusable, uh, which was okay if we only needed to use it once, but the chances are we we're probably gonna have to use it twice and that was a big debate. But, but, the, but the flight mechanics was that you, you made the, the one burn and it was gonna come around the moon and it was gonna be the number you talked about it wasn't like we deliberately extended the flight 24 hours. It was like we were really trying to get them back on a free return, and which did several things. One is that <laughs> if, he's, if, a thing had, if he had died on the thing, he would have at least landed in the earth. Uh, <laughs> but we weren't really thinking like that. But anyway, <laughs> how, how's that, Jim? Yeah. Nothing like lowering expectations. <laughs> but, <laughs> But anyway, we, uh, uh, you had to make the burn, and the burn was just going to was going to uh, bring you, put you on a trajectory that would whip around the moon, and you came back at at some time, and then later we were able, of course, to augment that and make it come back quicker. But uh, but it wasn't deliberately to extend them 24 more hours. It was to get them uh, on a safe trajectory. Well, I, I really don't think we could have used the uh, big engine anyway because uh, when we lost all the oxygen, uh, we lost the uh, fuel cells that uh, used oh. oxygen. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and so we didn't have a, and we controlled the uh, engine by means of electricity, so we, we wiped that off right away. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean the, the service module engine. I was talking about the descent engine. Oh, the descent engine. Because we were probably going to have to use that again or rather than, uh, or preferred to, rather than run the thrusters for an extended period of time, which was another option. Um, I could say something about the process, which I think is, is instructive. Um, one of the things that happened when, when the tank exploded and we finally got over into the lunar module and got it powered up and pretty much uh, powered down the command module. Um, at that point, uh, we took Kranz's team, the, the team that had been on duty when the tank exploded, we took them offline and said, go figure out, you know, their duty was to go figure out what configuration we left everything in and how we could power up the command module when we had to re-enter. The other three teams, which were Milt's team, my team, and Glenn Lunny's team, then had the process of trying to figure out what are the trajectory options we have. We had guys looking at the systems, trying to figure out how much consumables we had, water, particularly water and, and oxygen. And uh, in the process, we, in that process, we had some really smart guys that could figure out trajectories and different ways to do things. First thing we did is we put them on a free return. They, both these guys used that comment. That means we were going to the moon if we didn't do something after this explosion. We were gonna go around the moon, but we wouldn't come back to Earth. And what we did quickly was put them on a free return with a small maneuver that allowed them to go around the moon and come back to Earth. Then we had the option of can we hurry this thing up and get them home faster? And we had several options, ways to do that. And we zeroed in on one that two hours after going back behind the moon, we did this maneuver that would put them back home 24 hours earlier, back to Earth. And it would also get you to the Pacific where we had a carrier because it was, I think, Initially, the free return was going to put you in the Indian Ocean. You would have probably had a destroyer or something out there trying to pick them up. So uh, we did that burn, uh, that maneuver, at two hours past, went past the moon, and it worked. And it was a real job for, for Jim and Fred and Jack to, to get that done because it was a little bit like trying to pat your head and rub your stomach. Uh, it was it was a real hard job, but they get they did it. It didn't have to be real exact. Uh, it just had to be close, which we knew he could get close. Uh, <laughs> we weren't sure he'd be exact, but <laughs> but anyway, it worked fine, and we get, and and it did hurry up everything. And you guys landed not that far from San Diego, which was nice. Um, I think we have. <laughs> yeah. 
maybe time I was for say it. one other thing, oh, sure. uh, Jeff, about that, uh, the procedures. You know, the procedures that the crew uses are a result of months of work and going over and over and doing, doing things. And, and that team had to uh, build those in a matter of, I don't know how many hours it was, but it wasn't certainly months, it wasn't even, it wasn't even a day. Now, Jim got real nervous about that because he thought a bad procedure, and he's right, a bad procedure in your hand is better than a good procedure that you don't have. <laughs> and, uh, and it was looking like he wasn't gonna get something in his hand, but, but they came through. But that was a pretty, uh, a pretty substantial activity that they were doing there. What, what, what the uh, mission control team was doing was to develop procedures to power up the command module because it was the only vehicle that had a heat shield to come back in. We were all doing the work in this very fragile lunar module, which normally we would throw away, which we eventually did. And, uh, and as the Earth got closer and closer and closer to us, and I never received the procedures from mission control to give to Jack Swikers so we could power up the command module and we could all eventually get into it for a safe landing. And so I got a little testy that one time and I, <laughs> you know, I said, you know, you guys, <laughs> let's get something up here so we can work on it. Easy, easy going level, got a little hot. <laughs> <laughs> one question um, that I had in, in general, um, and this is for anyone who would want to respond to this. Um, when Jim and I were first uh, marketing our book um, a number of years ago, the first three agents I went to whom we uh, offered the book to said, you know, nobody is going to want to read about three guys who didn't land on the moon 22 years ago. I think those agents have now left the business. Um, uh, obviously, those agents were wrong. And obviously there's something about this mission that historically has resonated for people and has resonated for children and for business schools and for all manner of folks who have been touched by it. And for anyone on this panel, I'd like to hear any thoughts you might have about why it's hit people at such a visceral level. I would say there's only two missions in the Apollo program that nobody really cares to read about anymore. That's Apollo 7 and Apollo 9, because we never went to the moon. Uh, I'm thinking yeah. that, that Jim here uh, attracts positive vibrations. You know, in Apollo 8 was a terrible year for the United States. It was riots, it was all this kind of stuff. And, and it wasn't a good, a good time to be an American. And, and that business, when we went to the moon and they read from Genesis, that was such an uplifting thing. And uh, I believe you got messages from people saying, thanks for saving 1968. And, and that's one thing. And another is that Apollo 13 brought the whole world together. I mean, if you look at the, the documentaries, and maybe some of that's in the, in the movie too, I guess, but the documentaries are this, people all over the world are stopping and looking at storefronts at televisions and, and praying the kind of prayers that, that they might pray Christians or anybody, uh, and concerned about the crew, and they were all united for that. And that, I doubt if that's ever happened in the history of the world except for this. Let me, let me add, uh, add something to this whole scenario uh, that follows on what Milt was saying. I have often wondered what the situation would be, what history would say, if Apollo 13 was a success. <laughs> if we landed on the moon, picked up some lunar rocks, said some forgettable words, <laughs> came back and landed on the Earth, the third lunar landing mission. Well, would Jeff Kluger ever write me and say, listen, I want to write a book about Apollo 13? <laughs> Would Ron Howard say, hey, I want to make a movie? Uh, there was nothing unusual then. Jack Swiker's statue would never be in the halls of Congress. And those phrases that everybody knows about and uses, Houston, we got a problem. 
You know, failure is not an option. Would never be in our lexicon. And so for the first years, I was very frustrated about not landing on the moon. And then after we started to write the book and get references from the people on the ground and the mission control, and I began to feel that it was not a success in its initial mission. But in retrospect, it was perhaps the best thing that ever could happen to the space program. Because we brought out the leadership, uh, the teamwork, uh, the initiative of people working together to get something done. And so from now on, I'm very grateful that history was shown the way it actually occurred. And I think, uh, Jim, were there any other closing remarks you wanted to make? Or uh, I don't think you need to, actually. <laughs> well, I, I just want to thank all the people here tonight that came to listen to the old Apollo 13 story and to really support the Adler Planetarium. I mean, this is a really a unique uh, uh, science center, premier science center. We're trying to really be an educational institution. I really thank uh, Michelle Larson and, and uh, uh, Scott Swanson for our lead the leadership here that's it's coming on now, and hopefully that we can continue uh, to really be a uh, successful teacher of the young people that come through here. <laughs>